We are in the midst of a digital business revolution, and that begins with IoT, that begins with data, that begins with machine learning, that begins with cloud. What's coming in the next 10 years is uh, the deepest technology and cultural shifts we've seen since the 1970s. IoT may be uh, one of the one of the drivers, but I would say uh, mobile broadband is possibly more likely to to be. The way in which IoT influences the development of 5G, well, it's it's top priority for just about every carrier, every vendor in in, in the world at the moment. Maybe as a driver, yeah, but I, I think it'll be a user of NFV, and it just makes sense. And, and, you know, the concept of network slicing is dedicated virtual networks for specific applications or geographies. So we would expect that a lot of it is about services. The question is really who provides what bit into the service. We have a use case on IoT, um, so there are definitely uh, use cases for NFV and IoT outside of 5G and within 5G. I look at it as being a user of NFV technology, along with all the other applications that you could slice a core network into doing. I mean, most of the IoT offerings, if it comes to IoT platforms and so on, is a cloud-based solution, which basically eventually will run on an NFV platform. I'd just like to finish with this before we go to the floor, which is, I take it then we can all agree that everybody needs, an, or all, everybody involved needs an IoT strategy. Um, that they need to leverage their existing infrastructure assets as much as they possibly can, and that they need to optimize the employees they have and re-enthuse and retrain them to be able to do this. Just a quick one word quick answer each or thereabouts. Is that the way things are going? And, and do you see this becoming a feasible, workable reality in a sort of almost semi-cooperative way within the next 12, 12 months, 18 months? And what do you think? Where are we? I think it's a journey. Obviously, I mean, we've been doing it before, as Pradeep said, and now it's, we're surging back again. But I do think that there is some symbiotic relationship between having a common platform and being able to do rapid customization in a more software-based environment that gives better economics and better responsiveness, easier prototyping. So 12 to 18 months, I wouldn't want to say that we're going to be at the 50 billion devices that have been predicted. <laughs> But I would say that it becomes much easier to capitalize and much easier to make money and much easier to manage and deal with an unpredictable environment. Okay. David. Agree. And um, in 30 seconds, platforms will democratize IoT. And at the end of the day, when we're, do when we're looking at this in and, you know, HD video, it's like the VHS of today, um, the... The, comp the shop that will win is who has the most meaningful data that delivers the right business insight to the right person at the right time. Customers, that's what they're thinking about. They're not thinking about the infrastructure, coverage, NFV, SDN, modules, 5G. No. Will IoT deliver the most meaningful data insight? And the company that gets to give more yeses will win. Thank you. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, it's a journey, right? It's a, it's a journey and there isn't one direct answer to it, but the fact that we're having this conversation and I'm, I'm impressed that the carriers are actually talking more than connectivity from that point of view, because that was a concern that I had initially at looking at this report that these value added services are going to be required and having a platform that allows you to do innovation is where you're going forward. So. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm actually impressed we're going in the right direction there. Thank you. Eric. Uh, so we started the NAV journey with uh, deploying some NAV services for uh, enterprise market, for example. Uh, and we believe we should become a, a software company. And as an example, we want to train, I think, 20,000 people within the company to be able to code. I think it's a good sign to say we want to, uh, to transform ourselves to be able to answer to, uh, to the market and especially the IoT. 
Thank you. Prodi. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a good good goal. I mean, that's the first time I've heard uh, yes, an explicit goal, but uh, I won't predict what happens in 18 months. But uh, the short answer is I think everybody now gets it. All service providers understand that this is what they have to do, make transformations in various areas. Some are ahead, some are planning well, like Orange, uh, but uh, they're all on that same journey. They're all on that same path. Some are waiting for others to do it, but I, I don't think it's a question of should we do it, it's, it's a when. Okay, thank you very much. Not going anywhere just yet. Um, I want to throw it open to the floor now. There's a couple of hand, handheld mics down there. Has anybody got any questions of a panel, the like of which you're not likely to see very often? Uh, service providers, vendors, and an analyst all in one place and not hitting each other. It's fantastic. So if anybody would like to ask a question, I've just got two things I want to ask you. Please, for the cameras, will you stand up? And for other reasons, will you please say who you are and where you're from? Thank you. Utter silence. First person gets a free PIP network for a year. <laughs> I thought a Samsung f seven. A Samsung S seven. Seven. S seven. You get a Samsung S seven. <laughs> get the fire going. The fire. <laughs> turn up the heat. Turn That's up right. The heat. Turn up the heat. <laughs> there's a big box in them down oh, there. There's one. There's one. Over there. Is there yeah. a question? There is. I have a question. Um, Andrew Coward. Uh, I ran strategy at Brocade. Um, if the panel were magically transported to startup land tonight, what kind of IoT startup would they want to work for and why? Nice question. Yeah. So really quickly, we just ran in the front part of an innovation contest with Verizon. And there were some really interesting byproduct applications that were virtual test points. Because you're in a virtual market, how are you going to do a physical test point? How are you going to do physical analysis? So I think that there's some very practical tools that you, you don't realize you really need them until you get in an environment where it's very hard to debug. And you feel like you're back in the old days before you had inline debugging for anybody who's an old software developer like myself. You're blind, and so you need that kind of capability. I think that's going to be way more valuable than anyone expects. And I would say startup, deep machine learning. Like, what, you, you just say that, and I'm having ventures follow you and find a way to fund you mm -hmm. to see how, because it's, it's key. It's, uh, so they, yeah, deep machine learning. Yeah, I mean, okay. I actually, are you sure you didn't read my notes? Because it's, uh, you know, it's, I'll give them back to you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you thanks, thanks. Okay. It says predictive <laughs> analytics and automation, right? So that whole machine learning concept is to say, now how do we make it smarter? That we've got some historical data and get to the point of automating and optimizing. It's more than just automating, it's then optimizing it and telling you. Those are, I think, the direction that I would be excited about from a startup. Yeah. One, one more yeah. plug for NFV. Yeah. You know, we have to understand that. Uh, think, of a, think of a drone collecting environmental data and, and surveillance data of pick a place. Right. That's a very different IoT application than a uh, smart meter sending a read or a read closer on a power line switching on and off. So with uh, an intelligence, uh, the intelligence of NFV on that IoT backbone, it can make smart decisions like uh, making sure that the resources are available depending on the application and doing cool things like keeping the analytics and the reporting at the edge of the network. So, you know, it keep, NFV keeps just popping up on it. Yeah, yeah I think that's probably analytics are still uh, a lot of work to do, to analyze the data, maybe to optimize also the, the collection of, of data. And uh, deep learning, I mean, yeah, do we need deep learning? Depends on, uh, on the kind of uh, data we collect. But, uh, but I agree that we need some, uh, some tools to help uh, uh, enterprise to analyze their data, to visualize them, and so on. And I'm not sure that we are, we are yet there. So I'd be boring and agree with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and say, that's a, I believe uh, this too, and so that's what I was highlighting in my talk this morning, that we, we have the compute locations, we are working on the connectivity, but what makes all this real is really the decision fabric we're building. We are building a decision fabric, and if we do it properly, that's what will add the value. 
That partially answered your question, Andrew, I think. Um, it sort of petered out as we got down the other end a bit, but there we are. Uh, we've got time for one more. If there's anybody out there who has anything they want to say, now is your chance. Hi, this is Bruce Ely with Riverbed. Um, it's kind of a follow-on to his question, and more particular to the carriers, and no offense to the analyst here, but another analyst, they're predicting uh, 20, 20 billion, 21 billion IoT devices by 2020, maybe 50. <laughs> and to the predictive analytics point, how do you as a carrier plan to handle all that data? Um, I mean, that's something that's, that's unimaginable right now. 21 billion new devices out there, right? Um, and and it's, it's, so to, if you can get the predictive point, right, and, and, and pull that down into something manageable, what's, what are your plans for that or what's your idea from that standpoint? Here's how I would personally answer the question, and I'll say personally, so when this gets back to HQ, it's not a company statement, uh, but a couple of things. So, uh, so the, the, the Verizon brand in the US, we are a consumer brand, and we have our own um, big data engine so that we can digest our own data our, uh, to be able to market better and deliver better insights to our customers. So we've got experience in big data and analytics. Uh, number two, with the recent acquisitions, uh, AOL comes in mind. Uh, AOL came in with some interesting data analytic capabilities. Uh, number three, some of the folks that uh, we actually have a, um, <laughs> a uh, big data and analytics team, uh, half of them are from NASA, they're in Palo Alto, so there's things that, that we're building. And last bit, uh, based on our how we've been acquiring companies for the past uh, 18 months, I think we're well positioned that if we feel we're missing a piece, namely, you know, machine learning, deep machine learning, any kind of analytics, I think we will go find it in order to deliver the ultimate, you know, IoT experience to that customer. Uh, we, we definitely have the pockets to do it, and we won't stop until we deliver, you know, a, a happy, uh, good cus customer experience. So one, just one thing that's an interesting example about the value of data, if, if people go beyond their own you know, in optimization and service, which is, tends to be the place where most of the operators have started, is how do I make my services better and predict value and give more services to my customers. But there's an insurance company in the US that allows you to put a sensor on your exhaust to determine how your insurance rates should be set based on how you drive. <laughs> and it turns out that after you privatize that data, there's resells of different analysis and different spins of that same data that was collected by the insurance company for where should I put a restaurant? Where do we need a stoplight? And different companies will actually do different analysis on the same data set and pay for the same data set repeatedly to get the better information. And so it's less about what do we do with all this data and where do we store it and what can we throw away. I think it's really how can we be creative in privatizing it to the point where somebody else can find value in it too. I think the questions are two parts. Uh, how are we able to collect data, to analyze them, and so on. So to collect data, analyze them, uh, it's not a big issue for us. We, we also have some tools. And for example, we sell uh, also the, the movement of population in France based on, uh, on, 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 on cell networks. Uh, that's one part. On the second part, how to, um, to host the billions of, uh, of devices. I think by the past, we, we were able to, uh, to accept the growth of traffic from mobile network or for fixed network. So we were quite uh, agile to do that. Uh, we'll need more, more uh, frequencies to be able uh, to host all these uh, devices, but I think it's a good way with uh, 5G. So I'm quite confident that we, we, will, be, we will be able to, uh, to cover all the requirements that, are, that will arrive with uh, the various... Uh, Ten markets. seconds, I'm counting. One. Okay, cool. So, uh, and if, if I may, back to the, um, how are we preparing the network? So, you know, we are already ahead with a CAT M1, which is a LTE standard. And we are, um, we're the, we're, we have a lot of partners like uh, Sequence, again, back at uh, Intel. And the pricing for these modules will be v extremely competitive to what we're seeing from LoRa and Sigfox, but the infrastructure is there now. So how are we preparing 
the network. We've put an IoT core on our LTE architecture to basically give space because we don't want your mobile phone streaming Snapchat, Facebook, NFL, MLB competing Pokemon Go. Uh, competing with a drone or a smart meter. So we're also doing it from an architecture level specific for IoT. David, you could have run 400 meters in that 10 seconds, but never mind. <laughs> I run fast. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is the end. Anybody got any last thing to say? Otherwise, we are going to wrap. Okay, then. I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsors, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and to Intel, to everyone on the panel for all the input and hard work. And a lot of stuff went on in the green room around the back before we started doing this. Thanks to everyone who's made such a beautiful venue like this look even greater. And thanks to you, the audience, very much. If you just, if I'm just, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to show your appreciation in the usual way, which isn't throwing bottles, by the way. Um, but, and then immediately after that, Werner Schaefer down there is going to come. Well, come up now, Werner. And, and uh, Werner Schaefer is GM and I don't know what else you are, Schaefer, uh, um, Werner. Uh, VP and General Manager. That's it. NFV at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. <laughs> so we're getting to the fun part. It's been a long day. We started at 7.30 this morning with our roundtables and uh, talked about Mano and all these things. So it was great. Thank you to the panel excellent to have you with us and I want to say just a few words uh, besides obviously us being a great partnership uh, with Intel we've started a lot of these things going back to BT we keep reminiscent about that uh, over five years now that we're working on NFV together but what we're here today the Lumen Museum is started in the 1930s actually 1934 it's the world's largest collection of antique cars there's about 240 in here and what we've prepared for you now is that you can actually, on the way back, when you grab some food, we got more food stations here around to have time and eat and talk, and we'll actually have tours for you. So on the way back there, there's some tour guides that will be waiting for you, and they'll take you through the exhibition. I had the chance to do that right before we started here. It's, phen it's phenomenal. There's some really unique cars here. There's one of the world left to see here. So this is really, really a great place. Use this time, please, to mix and mingle. Did you want to ask me about Swisscom? You wanted to ask me about Swisscom. I have to say you that. You know what? I, I want to ask you about Swisscom and the Aston Martin. Oh, there you go. So the Aston Martin is right back there. Um, and uh, I make it very easy. Uh, Armin Fight from Swisscom is sitting right there. So if you have any questions about it, we'll punt it to him. Great partnership. We just did an interview with Telecom TV uh, yesterday. You will hear more about that. So. A uh, typical uh, uh, case of don't all believe everything that's in the papers. I think that's for our election yes. too, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let's not go there. Don't even read the papers with the election. <laughs> that's right. So have fun, enjoy, mix and mingle. This is what this is all about. Exchange your, your thoughts, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what better way to do it than looking at some really fantastic cars there. So thank you again. Thanks to the panel. Yes. Appreciate it. David, Ray, Eric, and Pradip and obviously Martin as well. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks.